Okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order of the Whateley Select Board on September 30th, 2020. This is also a joint meeting with the Whaley Elementary School Committee to talk about uh, an appointment to the school committee. First item on the agenda is meeting minutes. Review and approve the meeting minutes from September 9th, 2020. Any uh, comments, discussion? Not for me. <clears throat> I move we uh, accept the meeting minutes. From September Second. 9th. Second. Okay. Roll call vote. Jonathan? Yeah. Joyce? Aye. Fred? Yes. Bender and payroll warrants. They were sent to each of us uh, by our, our email accounts. Uh, any comments on it? No. 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 Okay. Public comment? Uh, we have a letter dated September 14th, 2020 from Gabe Cooney on regards to the Poplar Hill Road construction that's been going on. Uh, I think the letter shows appreciation for our fine and dedicated highway superintendent that has been actively involved in the uh, in the project there in front of Gabe's house. Uh, I think it's positive comments that I guess we, we appreciate that. We don't always get positive comments. It's more people complaining, but uh, <laughs> I think uh, Keith deserves a, a round of applause for, for that, so. Always, yeah. Always. Did you want to say anything about that, Keith? Oh, um, I just, you know, I appreciate the letter. Um, Definitely, you know, Gabe has got a few more questions than the average person with all of the, you know, things that have taken place and grant you it's been a, a, a very radical change to go from a gravel road to a paved road. And so by the time in about a week's time, it should be pretty well complete and um, looking a lot different than it did a few months ago. Okay. Anybody else want to comment? No? Okay, again, thank you, Keith, for your fine work on that project. Uh, continuing on with public comment, does anybody have anything else they want to discuss that's not on the agenda for this evening's meeting? Hey, Fred, um, we received, well, we received a letter yesterday um, from Richard Smith expressing concern about uh, pedestrian safety on Long Plain Road. Um, he talks about how he walks there on a daily basis. He encounters speeding cars, drivers distracted by phones and other occupants and vehicles constantly failing to yield space to pedestrians. Um, so he was hoping that the, the town would consider enhancing trolling and enhanced patrolling in concert with actual issuance of citations as a method of remediation. Perhaps some form of signage reminding drivers of their duties to pedestrians would be in order as well. So it's a letter expressing concern about essentially speeding cars on Long Plain Road and not slowing down when there's pedestrians in the road. Um, and I, I think the section that, that he and his wife walk approaching the town offices is pretty narrow. Um, so I don't know that there's a ton of shoulder space there right. well i i think i i see where our, our police department does do the traffic surveillance uh near the town offices i i think they're on long along plain road uh i've seen that in their weekly logs and, and the other thing I, i've noticed and maybe somebody from the school committee can comment uh within the last week or two uh, i think uh, i'm not in tune to what's going on at the school because I don't have kids going there, but maybe people aren't paying attention to the, to the speed limit signs to slow down for the school. Now, I assume by seeing cars there and people coming and going that, that school is open, at least maybe teachers, uh, and it should apply 
every day between the hours of eight and four. Is that is that true, uh, Bob? Do you? Well, what's the status of the school? Um, school is in a hybrid right now, uh, so there's some some remote and some hybrid in in person teaching right now. Um, so. If the, if the sign says from eight to four and the speed limit is supposed to be, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if somebody knows, I think it says 20 miles an hour, it does, 25 yeah. miles an hour, then they should be if going. they're going 40, they're going, you know, double the speed limit if it's 20. So, I mean, that's why the sign's there, even though we have a really good fence system there. So kids are out for recess and there again, I'm not sure about recess during the, uh, during the hybrid and stuff, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's no interacting of kids on the playground, as far as I know. I haven't been to the school, so I, I'm not sure. Maybe Maureen can chime in a little bit more on that. Well, my kids have only been there once so far, and it was a half day, and it was more of an orientation, I think. I think there's they're planning to do a lot of outside time, teaching time, and probably some structured outside play, but the kids will not be running in the road if that's what the concern is. Well, but beyond that, you guys, because of the constant unknown that is part of life now, people should say, hmm, I wonder whether kids are around. I'm going to be careful because they might be, because the scat the class schedule might be different because of this, of this bizarre time we're living in so it needs to be adhered to because you're right. we don't know you're right the speed limit we, is posted it doesn't matter whether whether we're in session right now or not right and really the only way to see any movement on this is to have a you know have the police patrol there as well i think that is completely reasonable request we don't have a traffic study for that road to the best of my knowledge so we don't know what the peak times are but a little bit more police presence would probably be noticed if they parked along there and i'm sure richard smith would allow its driveway to be used if we were to ask him for that i, I don't really see a, a problem with forwarding this on to our police chief to see when he can fit in a little more time on long plain road um, in the area of the school there where the houses are and so on. But maybe it, you know, it could be. A, a speed, the, the portable speed limit, flashing speed limit sign. I think we, we have one that works periodically, I guess. Maybe that would help. Mm -hmm. it, might, it, it also might be 50% of the people that are speeding are parents running, maybe running late, getting the kids to school. So, I mean, that... Well, that's, I see Brian laughing, but you know it's it probably yeah. true. Yeah, not these days, but I know in the past, sure. Yeah, it it, it you know it it brings home the the conversation that we had back in the spring around budget season, um, and obviously the budget this year was was a challenge for obvious reasons. But there is a, a capital request out there for more of those. Um, hey. Your speeding signs, right? Um, One you know, powered, etc. And we couldn't afford it this year, but but maybe it needs to. There needs to be a message sent to the capital planning committee that this perhaps needs needs to be uh, bumped up on the priority list, not just on Long Plain Road, not just because Richard sent an email, which he should have, because people speed on that road, but they speed on Swamp Road, they speed on Christian Lane, they speed, you know. They speed <laughs> So I think this needs to be bumped up on the priority list, perhaps, for capital is, plan. Is there any grant money out there that we can get for uh, the signs that you're talking about? Well, I think, Brian, we did apply for for some signs, right, through the police department? Uh, we've submitted, there's, we have two grant applications in uh, for the mobile radar signs, two different grant applications. One of them specifically for uh, school zone sign radar combination and then another one for um just for like uh pole mounted radar feedback signs which are the signs we're talking about so yeah there are there's two grant applications in did you say those were mobile or they're just pole mounted stationary um put them there and they stay there 
They're so they'll and Keith knows this better than I do, but they could they attach to a I believe like a road sign post, mm -hmm. um, so they can stay there for a period of time, but they can also be they can also be moved, but they're not meant to be moved on like a daily basis. Okay, and are these yeah, because I know the pro the big problem with the one we have is that it took out one of our officers for six weeks of back injury to yes. to move it uh, to where it. Uh, to where it would go, and then it only works for a few days on the battery. <coughs> are these also battery powered, or are they um, power uh, powered from a another source? The uh, I believe the school zone ones, which are more permanent, are solar, and I believe the other ones are battery. Yeah, I believe it's solar. So, Brian, this request you got was it written uh, letter or was it email? Um, this was a letter we received in the mail yesterday. Okay. Could you just re reply to, to uh, Richard that I guess thank him for his concerns and we're working on improving the monitoring of, of traffic flow on, on Long Plain Road. Yeah. For grants and something like that just to let him know that we're, we haven't forgot about it. Sure. And I'll also forward it to uh, Chief Savini to ask him to to focus on that area a little bit more. Right. Is that right? Yes, that would be good. All right. And Brian, can you look, um, if you can find out any updates on the status of, the, of those grant proposals? Yep. Okay. Any yep. other any other items uh, under public comment that are not on the agenda? Okay. Moving on, uh, next item is the schedule appointments with the Whaley School Committee, because this will be a, a joint meeting with the school committee and, and the select board to review, discuss, and vote to fill the vacancy on the Whaley Elementary School Committee. Uh, I guess, Bob, Bob you're, you're a chair of the committee? Well, Maureen is. Maureen is, okay, well, I'll turn it yeah. over to Maureen. Okay, I, I'm not sure about the process, but I know we got four candidates. Um, I think we all got a copy of their letter of interest. Beth Riley, Henry Frechette, Paula Jenkins, and Luke Strzgowski. Um, so I don't know what we do now. We can have a discussion. Can I can I interject for a second? Um, at the risk of people not being happy with me, I, I think I'm very comfortable having a, a conversation about about the four candidates. Um, I, I know I am personally not comfortable at all with a vote tonight. Um, we the the candidates we're not even sure all candidates were made aware of this meeting um i i think it, it's only fair to have them present when they're here and even if they were made made aware and again i don't know whether they were or not but uh with with what two days notice and i'm not blaming brian so brian don't think i'm coming down on you at all i just think that the, the right. process that we that that the state puts us through stinks um but People have lives, and and again, I don't know whether any of them are on the call or not. But it, it's either it's it's not right that they either weren't informed or were informed in such a short period of time that they may not have been able to drop their lives. So I personally think we should take this opportunity to have a conversation about the search, um, but we should schedule a special meeting to have an actual vote and make sure that we give ample time for those who are interested in the position to be here so they can say a few words uh, in support of, of their candidacy. It just seems fair to me. Otherwise, it's not a fair or transparent process. Okay, well, I, I, see we have, I see we have one person on, I, I think, uh, joining us here. And- Yep, yeah, one. <laughs> the, the, the other thing, well, I, I kind of agree with what Jonathan is saying, but I, I think maybe here in front of the school committee, is, is there a, a urgent need to fill this position like soon or can it wait for our next meeting or? 
or when, is, when is your next meeting? Well, we could we could schedule a special meeting, couldn't we, Fred? Well, we, a special meeting if we wanted. Sure, we whenever you are ready or, or whenever your next your next meeting is, I guess we could join you. I, I don't think we're meeting until October fifteenth. No, Waitley School Committee. Okay, well, ours is the fourteenth, supposedly tentatively. Yeah. Hi, hey, Fred. I um I actually don't necessarily share John's concerns. I think the word has been out. I think the the people who who put in letters knew the timeline when they put in their letters. Um, it's a fill in position for a matter of you know, what eight nine months. Um. I, the, having done, I've been actually through this once before, not as a candidate, um, but I was doing all the meetings for FCAT at the time. Uh, last time there was this kind of vacancy on the school committee, four people put letters in, the select board just decided, um, and they went on and they picked somebody who wasn't interested necessarily in continuing, um, and they uh, there was an election after the nine months and someone, you know, someone won. Uh, the election who was not the same person who was appointed. Um, so I, I guess I don't think it's that as big a deal to make a decision quickly based on our letters, but I don't particularly object to waiting a little bit. I, I don't know what I would hear from someone that would make me decide one way or the other. I think we probably have four good candidates who their heart is in the right place, which to me is really important. Um, and they all seem to have skills that would contribute to the school committee. Um, and I don't really want to make more of a contest out of it than it is. It's not really a contest. We just have to pick somebody who's willing to do the job for the next nine months and, and, and go from there. The, the voters get to pick in June. Okay. So, Brian, was, was there a, a closing date on this announcement for candidates? Yeah. What we asked the folks was, we only asked folks to send a letter of interest by September 28th um, in time for that we would have the letters by this meeting. Um, if if this joint committee would like to do interviews, um, that's obviously something that should be discussed in this meeting like it is now. Um, and we'll, we'll just go from there. Uh, but the, the, the request for people to attend the meeting um, and to have some type of interview was, was was not made yet. So we'd have to make that request if that's what we want to do. And I'm not saying an interview. I'm saying an opportunity to make a, a, a statement. Um, well, I think the letter is the opportunity to make a statement. Remember, this is a temporary position. Well, let me go ahead and ask Maureen, are, are you comfortable or prepared to make a recommendation or selection this evening? Um, I... I, I do think we have, uh, uh, you know, enough information in the letters of interest. Um, I know at least one candidate wanted to come to the meeting, but had a work engagement tonight and couldn't make it. So if anyone wanted to talk, um, you know, that was short notice. But I do think we have enough information in these letters as well. So. I agree with I agree with Maureen. Okay, I mean I, we do have we have four great candidates. They they all that they, they're all really great. We don't always have this problem. <laughs> you know, that's um, for sure. Uh, okay, so I guess would it be proper to ask the school committee for a recommendation? Or? No, we, Fred. I think we all have one vote. Oh, we're doing it as as a group, all, yeah. all, all of us. And the school committee is is uh, what just Bob and Maureen. Uh, no, yeah. So then we have five votes. So we have to nominate one person, and somebody's going to have to second it, right? And see if the nominations stay open. I, I, is that how I, this is going to work? <laughs> somebody would make a motion to appoint somebody to the position. It would need to be seconded, and then Do there would be a vote on the motion. If the motion doesn't pass, then we would look for a, a second motion on a, a different second motion, and there would be a vote on that. And 
so on and so forth. Well, why wouldn't we just nominate all four and then have a vote? Well, then you're going to vote four times. No, you're going to vote. Each person's going to vote for one person. No, sounds like we have an argument for ranked choice voting here, huh? Uh, <laughs> oh, why don't you do, why don't you do a straw poll and then figure out what it is, and someone make a formal yeah, motion. I'm trying to make it as transparent as possible. I I'll shut up. <laughs> Hey, I'm happy there's four people that want to be on the school committee. I know. Yes. I want to treat Hallelujah. Them it and doesn't mean you can't resign, Bob. Can't resign, uh, Bob. <laughs> Before we do this, Brian, can I ask you a procedural question? Do we yes. or, the, or the school committee have to vote to accept the resignation of this person? Doesn't some action have to be taken first? Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't know. No. Uh -huh. Well, I, I see. I see that maybe other other boards and committees, uh, other towns. I see that that they appoint new people, but they haven't really accepted resignations, or the person hasn't told he's he was accepted as a resignation. Well, but we I, have a letter. We have a letter from right, this, the do we, Don't we have to accept that? I don't I believe so. Know. But Fred, I know the person who resigned pretty well. <laughs> I, I know. I know, and but. I if you would like to do that, that's fine. It, it would not hurt to do that. Even if it wasn't accepted, she's not coming back. <laughs> no. no. We may we don't not want her to leave. They would have to come back. I'm pretty sure there's a constitution or something that would prevent <laughs> us from doing that. We're not going to pay her the big salary, though. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're back to, I guess, hearing from... Uh, well, getting a, a, a motion for a, a nomination and then doing a vote on that nomination. Okay. Oh, Maureen's the chair. Okay. Um, I do think that there were four great candidates and it was, I, I wish we could have more um, than one tonight, but we do have the, the election next spring. Um, so I nominate Beth Riley. I'll second. And I'll second that. Oops, sorry. No, go ahead, Bob. Fine. So I'll second it. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Maureen? Maureen, yes. Bob? Yes. Okay, uh, Jonathan? Um, yeah, but I want my transparency noted. I mean, Beth's great, but okay, yes. <laughs> Joyce? Uh, I'm going to abstain. Fred? Uh, I, I guess so. I'll, I'll abstain. I, I doesn't really matter. Well, there's three yeses so far. Yeah. So even and if you say no point. or abstain. And it's, and it's sort of my point about we're abstaining because we have, I, come on. I, yeah, oh, it, it, it next, is hard to hey, pick among four good candidates. And right. I don't know them next all. Next election. Yeah. Yeah. Next and election, there's going to be two spots. Right. Two spots next election. Yeah. And the people who do know the candidates better than I have made their voices heard, and that's fine with me. And it is a fill-in. I don't know that Bethany's willing to work for three more years after that. So... I think we, we write to all the candidates and thank them for their interest and let them know that there'll be two spots open in the June election. And, and, uh, and we can even say it was, we acknowledge that we had four really good candidates and it was a shame we only got to pick one. Right, and, and, and just so people know the process, the person who fills this seat, if, if it is Beth, um, she would, she, she and, and other people, you have to decide which seat you are running for. And if you run for this, this seat we're talking about tonight, you would again have to run in a year. Yep. June. Yep. Because it'll be and a one-year term and a three-year term coming up. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Okay, so the so the vote is three, three yes and what, two abstain? Yeah. Okay. 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 And well, uh, thank you very much. Yes, okay. And, and really, I sincerely thank all the people who stepped up here yeah, and, and, um, 
and I hope you all run. Hope you all run in June. And, and seriously, Luke, I know you're here. Uh, I think, you know, it's commendable that you were able to show up. I, I appreciate it so much. Uh, Not a problem. And I, yep. and I hope you do run in, uh, in the, uh, what are we talking about, in the spring. And you can, you can call him. He can run Thanks. against me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't I, want your job, Bob. I'm, I'm and good. I, and I hope Beth runs too, and, and, and you guys would be. Yeah. Able. Yeah. My last time we had a scientist on the school committee, that was so cool. So. <laughs> okay. Any more discussion we need with our uh, school committee this evening? Do they have anything they want to bring up? No. Nope. You guys are awesome. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank Thanks, you. Maureen. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Good night, Bob. Good night. Good night, Maureen. Good night, Jim, Bob. I want to get it done. Okay, moving, moving on the agenda. Next item is uh, COVID-19 state of emergency. We got to discuss, review, consider modifications to our, we have three directives here on, on guidance. Uh, what to do during working conditions in town buildings and town, for town departments and boards and committees. Brian, do you want to uh, discuss what you had in mind here, what, what we were looking at making changes? Or um, Yeah, so the first one that, that we had for discussion uh, is actually number two. Um, we always list these in case things come up uh, during the week or in the last two days because things happen pretty quick with COVID. Um, but what we had wanted to talk about was um, really the general idea of outdoor meetings on town-owned land, um, town-owned property. So that would be, um, so in this case, it, it would be the town hall. Um, and at the last meeting, I had, had said that I would um, seek out some guidance from the Board of Health as to um, what they thought might be appropriate. Um, and in the packet, there's um, there's two emails, and sent from from Board of Health members, and it essentially says that as long as people are practicing social distancing, um, wearing a mask where appropriate, and following the, the the gathering size, that that they thought it would be um, from a public health standpoint, they thought it would be okay. Um, that's not to say that. Um, <clears throat> We have to do it. We meaning the meaning you guys, meaning the board of selectmen or select board need to do it. Um, but that's that was their public that was their public health opinion on it. So it really comes down to a policy decision as to whether we want to open that up or not. Has anybody been asking to hold meetings on outside our buildings? Uh, we know of one. Yeah. Well, and it, it, is it? Fair to say, and I'll and I'll direct this to our Augusta town administrator, that we've already set precedent because we had uh, interviews outside of town hall for a highway opening. Yep. So we've had a town meeting at the elementary okay. school. So it just seems like precedent. It's already set. People wear masks. If people don't want to wear masks, then they they can't attend. And 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 there's no standard ends or buts, and it's not their personal mm -hmm. choice. Okay, well, what about uh, recording of the, of the meeting? So uh, the, the way that I see that, that that's a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess the context of and what we were talking about was, was non-town um, non -town meetings, lowercase t, town meetings. Um, because, yeah, yeah, the challenge of having a, a town board of committee meeting is that um, we'd like it to be on Zoom, we'd like it to be recorded, and we'd like people who do not want to show up and risk exposure to, to be able to participate in the meetings. So that makes it a challenge to, to do yeah. town meetings outside. And I think we didn't really have in mind, we were thinking of <laughs> gatherings that were not like um, meetings that are subject to the open meeting law kind of things, um, you know, meetings like like groups that might just want to get together in an outdoor place, public place, and 
they have every intention to keep the numbers within what's um, allowed or recommended and keeping distance and keeping masks. I would think that that's, I mean, uh, how many, we don't have that many of those groups, but um, would like clubs, right? Small, like snowmobile club, the Grange, historical society, um, groups that are not really public entities. Although I don't know, the snowmobile club, I don't know if that's actually a public entity that has open meeting law stuff as well. Uh, but the, that was really the kind of thing we were looking at. Um, and I think what, the, the, what would have to be really clear is what are the masking and distance and number limits? I think that, and, and it has to be indisputable. So they're like, if they're put up, if we do, we're, if we let people meet in the, the little space behind town hall, which is outdoors, then we should probably put up a sign that says six feet distance and masks required. Um, I think at town meeting, we had if people were from the same household, they could be together, but six feet apart from others. Um, and I, I just think we just have to be really clear about it so that if, I don't know, one of our officers comes by and happens to take a look, then you know, they've, got some, they've got something to, uh, to point to to say, look, these are the rules. Or if the people running the meeting are um, or, you know, have someone come who doesn't want to wear a mask or doesn't want to keep social distance, um, that you've got something there to say, hey, look, this is the rules and you've got uh, at least a leg to stand on there. Um, I think if we can be really clear and we can stay within what our Board of Health is comfortable with, which I think is the state guidelines, then I, I don't see a reason to restrict the use of public land or, or you know, properties that are uh, outside of our buildings. That seems like it's pretty reasonable. I guess I have a concern if we're, we're letting these organizations meet on town property, why don't we let uh, town boards and committees meet as well? I, I mean, is it, the, is it more productive for them to meet, uh, to meet as a group, okay, outside, say? Uh, even though we, we got the, the recording requirement, maybe we need to have minutes and minutes show up uh, shortly after that if they're taking committee actions. I, I think just to allow non-town groups to meet on town property is like, I, I don't know, it's kind of, kind of bias, I, I guess, in a way, because some of them people on these committees also are on town boards and committees too. So I guess you're, you're treating them differently if they're not an official town meeting. I, I don't know. I, I think it's you're allowing some people and not others. It's like uh, I'm letting as long as as long as FCAT doesn't want to record them, and FCAT really is only interested in it, in a few of the of the <clears throat> uh, boards and committees in town. No offense to any of the others, but you know, well, they, no, people are interested in all the other meetings though. Well, but People they are interested in planning board and, and other meetings. If those recordings were available to look up, people would watch them and it would have benefit it would benefit us to have those recordings. Well, but I guess my point is is that that's not currently happening and it's not in the immediate plans of FCAT to do that. So if there are committees oh, we don't need FCAT to record the meetings when they're on Zoom. We can record them and just send them the link and they can make it available on, on YouTube. Okay, but to, to for people to look at that recording, if it's not posted on FCAT, you can't do it unless you ask Brian or Amy to, to send you the link. But FCAT will not, they, they don't say no. We send them a link, they put it up. It's it's a very simple process for them. Yeah, but, but Joyce, I guess I would use the example, I'll use my own open space committee. FCAT doesn't cover it. That, but FCAT's not the point. The no, point we, is we have a policy that we started last March that said you have meetings on Zoom and you record them and that's the rule, okay? You, there's an exception. You can go and ask for an exception to meet in person. If you make the good case, then you can meet in person. But our policy was that meetings will be recorded, okay? And it would have been really, really good on a couple of occasions for 
planning board meetings, had they been recorded, that would have been really good for someone to be able to go back and check that recording and say, well, well what did they promise? Right. What did they ask for? Okay, so we're sort of, we're sort of several different issues. One is, can people of the town meet in a socially distant and appropriate way on town property? That's one issue. Another issue is, can town boards meet outdoors on public property so that they can avoid this idea of being recorded and just have minutes? I think those are two different things. And I think one of them will be sorted out as winter arrives. And the other is, We've got a policy where we decided, the three of us together, we all voted for this, that those board meetings that happen on Zoom will be recorded. Okay. And, we, and are we, are we going to change that policy just because people haven't been going with it? Or do we go and say, say to these boards, which I think we did two weeks ago, reminding them, hey, you know, you were supposed to be recording these all along. Start recording them, please. I, okay, so there's kind of three different things here. And I think the one we brought up that I think we should decide first is the one about people meeting on town property, outdoors, social distance with proper uh, masking and so on. And with, you know, with before the we, before we get, And then the others are different things. Before we just get into that discussion, uh, Jonathan was trying to say something. Uh, I'll let him continue. And then Judy wanted to make a comment here. So, okay, Jonathan. I, I would just use my recollection of A, why we made the Zoom policy that we did in terms of recording and, and also make sure that I believe that no one's making the decision. No one, I don't believe anyone would be making the decision to meet outside rather than through a Zoom meeting for the express purpose of not having the meeting recorded. Okay. The second thing is the reason we required the recording for Zoom, as I recall, is that we were not allowing anyone to attend our meetings because of social distancing protocols inside, et cetera. I just bring up that if groups could figure out how to meet outside, and again, as Joyce, you correctly point out, it's a win limited window because of the weather. If groups could figure out how to allow the public to attend outside, six foot distancing, masks, et cetera, it alleviates the original need that we used for going on recorded Zoom to begin with. Okay. okay, Judy, you wanted to say something? Well, I think that was 50% of my comment. I think one reason for the Zoom is to allow public participation in the meeting directly. And some of the spaces that we're talking about aren't large enough for that. Um, and secondly, recording is for... I, I think the Zoom... I think you want to separate Zoom and recording because to some extent the, the purposes are different. But the I'm policy sure Brian can clarify yeah, that better. Than but I the know. policy was made when we went to Zoom that we would record all the meetings. I'm not and, arguing that at all. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Because but I do think I understand that, that it's different. There's two different things here, but there is no reason why we can't do both. And it has helped town after town after town to have recorded video of meetings when someone comes in and says, I'm gonna sue you because you said this and didn't do it. When you have the video to back up, this is what you said. Those things my go only, away. My only point is that recording right? doesn't solve the public participation issue. Oh, I, I agree. It, it's not intended I to. So. I, I, it's not intended to. But it's the, the recording, I think, is still really important. And it's something that we, we, we couldn't afford in the past. We couldn't afford to have FCAT come. They don't have enough people to cover all the meetings. Okay. Um, so if, okay. if we have meetings, if we allow meetings outside for whatever kind of group we decide, how are they going to be recorded? They would not be recorded, but they'd not be on Zoom. They just have to comply with public meeting law 
and they have to be something the Board of Health goes along with as far as spacing and masking and so on, which is a, a lot to do to have an outdoor meeting to make sure you've got seating and so for however many public you might expect and a few more in case you get more members of the public. It's a pain in the butt to do a proper open meeting law meeting outdoors under these conditions. I don't expect people will do that. But I do expect that other groups of people might meet behind the library, might meet behind the town hall, beautiful location on a fall day to talk about what their club wants to do. And if they were meeting at Hurley Heat Park, that'd be legal because <laughs> Hurley Park is open, right? But if they could meet at, you know, smaller groups could easily meet at these other locations if we would just uh, update our policy and just make it clear what the what the constraints are, what the what the health conditions need to be, right? The distancing, masking, and maximum number of people. But I think it's that simple. If they wanted to meet in a Waitley Inn parking lot around the tables, it's not town property. Is that an acceptable? You have to ask the owner of the Waitley Inn. Well, a committee could meet there if they wanted, right? They could meet anywhere, anybody. But they, I, uh, you're talking about an open meeting law meeting? Yes. Then I don't, I don't think it'd be, I don't think it'd be as easy to do, but you know, is, I mean, open meeting law is what we have to comply with, right? right? That's the bottom line. But if you're gonna do the meeting on Zoom, hit record. And, and I got to be honest, I, as, as much as I, you know, I, I want to make sure we're clear as to why we went to Zoom and all that. If people decided to meet in the parking lot of the Waitley Inn, I would seriously question why they wanted to do that. And whether they really could comply and, and whether trying not to comply was, was part of their reason for doing that. Because we really still have to take social distancing into account. And... You know, and, and, and again, no one's going to use the Waitley in parking lot and, and Chip wouldn't allow it, nor should he. But but if people go out of their way to, to, to meet in person, I think human nature is that it's going to be really hard to maintain social distancing because I see it all the time and very few people figure it out. Okay, okay. Uh, let me ask you, anybody else that's on tonight? Uh... Keith and uh, Adelia, do you have anything you want to comment on this item? No. If okay. Fred, can I just can I just add one thing? Okay. I, I think another reason why we were doing the Zoom is that is that it was it was for the for the people who are even uncomfortable coming to a meeting six feet apart. Um, right. Yeah. So it, it gave them the op it gave those those people the opportunity to participate without having to leave their house or out or risk exposure. Um, so I think that's, that was one of the reasons why we were doing the zoom. It, it, it was to allow those people who were not comfortable going out to be, to have the opportunity to participate in the meeting, the same as somebody would if, if they were comfortable to go to an in-person meeting. No. Well, I think the question on the table is, do we allow non, again, to, to Joyce's original point, do we allow non-town, however you put it. Open meeting law meetings. Yeah, to, 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 to meet on town property if they chose. I'm personally fine with it. Do, do we want to know if that's happening somehow? Or does it matter to us if we allow that? I'm just thinking ahead. Are, are we going to want to know? Is it possible to put the same restrictions on the exterior portions of town buildings that we do on Hurley Park? Just because that's an outdoor space right. that, you know, any meetings on town property would have to adhere to those, um, to those constraints, right? And open meeting law meetings have other constraints they have to abide by, which would make it not, they would probably not be meeting outdoors um, under these conditions anyway. Right. So they've so got to be, they've got to be six feet apart to your point, George, I, I think, and tell me if I'm, if I'm not right, they've got to wear a mask and they've got to bring their own soccer balls. <laughs> That's right. 
Yeah. But yeah, uh, that's fair. The the masking requirement from the Commonwealth says that if there's if there's so the masking requirement from the Commonwealth is that if you're six feet apart and you're outdoors, you don't need to wear a mask. But if you have a gathering of uh, more than 10 people or different household units, then everybody needs to wear a mask. That's the current guidance. Even at six feet. Yes. Even at six feet. Yeah. That's and my understanding of the current guidance. Okay. And if you are wearing a mask, are you allowed to be closer than six feet? Yeah. I do not believe so. Unless you're the same household unit? Okay, can can we make a sign with those rules and uh, put it up in the appropriate places? I would think, um, I, I guess the library technically controls the library property, um, but- I think they would go along with it. Town, if we, I would think we could, we could use the plus one button when we order signs, but um, what locations we'd be worried about would be outside of the town offices, outside of the town hall, um, center school. Sure, sure. Well, because uh, there's that nice hill there. That's a nice place to. Yeah, it's a nice spot. There's a nice yard. You, you um, also, you also got it. Let's say transfer station or the highway department. Uh, the field in front of those. Yeah. Police station. Property. Any Fire. town. Any town on property. Any, any town property. Yeah. Right. Okay, school. So it sounds like there's half a dozen signs would school. be needed, and so it, it seems. Re I mean, sounds like we're in agreement. Do we need an actual motion? I would agree. think so. Yeah, I might need wording too. Okay, Joyce, you want to try? Okay, um, I move that we. Um, Amend the order reopening town buildings to the public for limited hours and appointments only. That's the document we want to amend, correct, Brian? Yeah, and, and maybe language because similar to what we have for Hurley Field, which says, Yes. Hurley Field. So um, outdoor gatherings will be permitted on, on all town property, town property. Um, consistent with guidance from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts reopening plan or something like that. You're reading if, my mind. I was just about to say, where's the clause on Hurley Park? Uh, <laughs> if, if, we, if we're too specific, then the guidance changes and we have to come back and amend this. So Right. So if we were to change Hurley Field to um, outdoor spaces on town property, will be available for use consistent with the guidance from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts reopening plan. Um, I don't know if we need to say this includes Hurley Park, the outdoor portions of, you know, uh, of, of, you know, a handful of buildings. Um, but if we just change the word Hurley Field to outdoor spaces of town owned properties. Yep. Okay. Then that would be my motion. Okay, Jonathan second. Okay, and this would this is with the understanding that if it's a town board or committee that they have to follow open meeting laws and if it is not then they're up to whatever they want to do on town property as long as they meet the, the right. requirements of, of distancing yeah distancing and mass and whatever and and size a group i would i would also offer a cautionary tale that when we're outside and people are given permission to be outside um, there is incredible scrutiny by passersby over whether they are adhering, that group is adhering to um, the guidelines set forth by our Board of Health and the governor's office. Um, sometimes that scrutiny is not accurate and sometimes it is, but scrutiny is scrutiny. So I would really encourage people to be extra cautious because I, I know it's out there and you get the phone calls and it's, and it's rough. Okay, and and if conditions change, uh, either maybe worse than what they are today, then we can revisit this. Yep. If we want to change, and they are going to get worse. Okay, and maybe the, something that may, may help us. The colder weather may help us. Maybe not. I don't know. So, okay, do we need a roll call vote, Brian, on this? Yeah. Okay, Jonathan. Yes. Joyce? Hi. Fred, yes. 
Okay. Uh, what else did you want to bring up, Brian, about the COVID-19 guidance? Um, was there any re resolution about recordings? Joyce kind of laid out two issues. One was. I think we should stick with our original guidance and just really get people to record. I think it's be it's in the best interest of the town and I think that's the bottom line. Okay. And it's in the best interest of transparency and it's so freaking easy to do. I have no problem with it. And I, you know, we might want to discuss extending that when we're back meeting in person at some point in, you know, in the next year um, that, that we still zoom record it just for that same, very same reason, Joyce. Yeah. I have a question. Okay. okay, go ahead, Judy. Last night, the planning board had a meeting and Don Sluter was hosting and he was recording and his Wi-Fi clicked out. He could talk to us by phone so he could participate in the meeting but we couldn't continue the recording because none of the rest of us could record. We felt we had to terminate the meeting. Was that correct? And, you know, we had many people from various, we had many applicants there, some of whom had time delays. So he finally got his, his Wi-Fi. actually it went out twice. We, we lost about half an hour in the course of the evening trying to keep the recording going. So how critical is this? Do we literally stop the process of pursuing an application where, where there is a time sensitivity and just because we physically can't record? We decided we had to. I don't know if that was the correct thing or not. Well, Judy, I think you should have two, two or three hosts so that if somebody, if that does happen, the, the host just bounces yeah. to the next person in line and that covers your bases. Yeah, the, uh, whoever's the host can make anyone else on the call a co-host. So if the host okay. drops off, then one of the co-hosts will become host and then that host can start the recording again. And so in your case, it would have, yeah, I don't know who it would have gone on to for a, a second host. Um, they can restart the recording. And then it could have been that Dawn could just continue on that meeting by phone and um, the meeting can continue to be. Well, recorded. maybe you should amend the guidance to say that. Well, I think we can have a Zoom supplement so that people understand how to use Zoom and, and uh, you know, so that these kind of problems don't come up. I don't think it needs to be our policy. Um, well, I we just, can say what are some best practices. I'm just telling you as a town yeah. board, we were in a dilemma mm -hmm. and it wasn't fun, especially okay. with all these people sitting there. So, so, also, so it, any help you can yeah. give would be greatly appreciated. Okay. Sure, okay. I, mean, I, mean, I, have, I have offered on many on occasions to give anyone Zoom lessons whenever they want. I, I, I think publicly, I started in March <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, Don Don does this for his job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not that, but he's. Yeah. I'm just just telling you that maybe a little extra communication would be helpful, because we really felt like we didn't yeah. have guidance. This is not the first time this has happened, by the way. Hey, I think there's there's two conditions where maybe you should have. The, the meeting should should occur on, on Zoom. It, it, one would be if it's a public hearing advertised in a paper and, and you're holding that hearing, you should offer people the opportunity to comment. And if you don't have it on Zoom, then I, I guess you should reschedule the meeting. And, and the second item, if you're taking an action, making an action uh, uh, approval or or something that, that should be recorded, uh, by Zoom or, or of course it'll be recorded in minutes, but but at least in Zoom as well. I think the Brian, whole you, what, should, yeah. what what guidance are, are, are you seeing uh, on Zoom related to, to these kind of activities or actions that boards are taking? I mean, would we 
I don't understand who the question is for. I'm asking Brian what he's seeing for for his experience with, with Zoom that, that it's coming from committees. I, I mean, other than we hear what Judy is saying, but. Uh, A little unfair to Brian because I just sprung it on him and he didn't know it was yeah. coming, so. Um, no, I can understand that you might've been confused about it. Um, I, I don't understand why people were confused from March through the end of August that they were supposed to be recording. But now that it's been clarified that we should be recording, maybe what we need is a, just a, a quick um, bit of guidance on uh, how to set up your Zoom meeting. You can set, if you set them up through the town's account, Brian can set it up so that it automatically records and you don't even have to worry about it. Um, so there's, there's technology fixes for the kinds of things you're talking about, but I would not be uh, averse to putting together uh, sort of a bullet point list of, if you're doing a Zoom meeting for the town, here's a few things to consider. Um, be aware that we have a chairman who likes to use his own uh, UMass account. I, you know, then I, the, I, these I, volunteers I, I don't use my hard account for town business. Okay, they, I don't. I, I, these it, volunteers are hard to control. Oh, and I okay, but I can still give them a list of best practices. But how to, to Joyce's point before, or not to Joyce to Judy's point before? I'm sorry. Why not simplify and say, yeah, you're going to be required to Zoom, and you are required to have a co-host. So that there's no gray area. Oh, I chose not to heed the advice that was given to me. It's required to have a co-host so that when people lose their internet connection, which they do, you know, people have four or five people on the on, on their Wi-Fi at the same time in a house. Um, then it's just required. It's just it's just part not best practices. It is the practice. I, I don't I don't see a problem with doing that. As much as I hate to overregulate. Okay, the the comment I have, I, I made it a couple of minutes ago. I don't know if I got an answer or not. When we do a, a Zoom recording, if it's not on FCAT, where are people going to go to see that recording? Whether it's a private citizen in town or it's another board committee, where are they going to go to see that? How are they going to get that recording? Brian, do you? How, yeah, how yeah. Would, they would they would make handle? if it's not on FCAT, they would need to make a public records request. Amy Amy keeps um all the meetings all the meeting links that are sent to us, she keeps. And it is not a problem to send all those meeting links to FCAT and ask them to post it. And that's probably gives easier access and it means people don't have to go make public records requests. Yep. It's already out there in an easy to find format. I don't think that has to be in the policy because the policy is about what people who are having meetings should do. This is about what Amy and Brian should do. And we can simply give them instruction to take any meetings that are not already posted on FCAT, send them to FCAT and ask them to ask them to post it. And they they would be happy to do that. Just give them a reasonable amount of time. If we don't you know, give them 10,000 meetings, it might not be up the next day. Right. I, I I don't I don't see that happening with other towns. I, I, I don't oh know. no, it is. It is. Look at Deerfield. Deerfield's got pretty much every meeting they have is is uh, recorded and put up on FCAT. Okay, I guess I don't look that much other towns, but yeah, well, yeah, I guess. Well, I see. So should we ask? I guess can I ask Brian to put something together if we need to. Amanda, we have a Zoom policy or Zoom directive on meetings. Do we do we need to put something out for the guidance? Could we oh. add to our given our original guidance? Just add um, that uh, another bullet point uh, about um, me, let's see meetings to be held virtually. Put um, not it's not bullet points; it's numbers. Uh, put a number eight. And all meetings will have a co-host who can take over the recording responsibilities in the case that uh, the host has an internet outage. I think that's some more to leave or whatever. Yeah. No reason. Given we don't have to say it's because of the internet, but 
all meetings should have a co-host. Right. Um, right. Okay. We don't need to vote on that, do we, Brian? Or we do? You want to amend policy? You need to. It's an amendment to a policy. Yeah. Okay. I'll make that motion. I'll second. Okay. Uh, before we do roll call, Judy, did you have something you wanted to say? No. No. Oh, okay. So you lit up like you were going to say, but okay. Uh, roll no, call. I was looking at, at the chef in the kitchen working hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll call vote. Uh, Jonathan? Yeah. Joyce? Aye. Fred? Yes. Fred, can I just uh, offer a suggestion to Judy about her original question and it was about what happens if you have technical difficulties. Um, the guidance from the um, on the open meeting law talks about um, so it talks about if a if a remote participant has technical difficulties or is being disconnected from the meeting it, it talks about um, the technical diff the technical difficulties being reflected in the meeting minutes. Um, That's a good point. So I don't necessarily know that you would need to stop the meeting um, if somebody were disconnected, but if the technical difficulty. There's a difference whether it's a participant or the recording. Per yeah. Per <clears throat> and then there was the time that the power went out in the hole. All of us disappeared, but that's that's a different issue. <laughs> Right. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on agenda. Uh, under old, old business, uh, first item, discuss and vote to approve a new lease with the Whaley Historical Society for the town hall. Okay, and I think we've got uh, Adelia is, is with us this evening. Did you want to... Uh, Say something on that item. You're you're muted, Adelia. You got to unmute. Okay, Judy and I have uh, submitted this letter, and we would like you to act on it so we would have an answer as to your thoughts are as to our request. I think we'd also like clarification on whether we can use the. Museum space or not? Ooh. Well, and your your re your request, well, other than to renew the new lease, is to get credit for the months that you weren't open. Mm -hmm. I think we asked for a very nominal credit. I think thirty five dollars a month, which forty five. Yeah, forty five. Yeah, um, it's it's a big amount to us, but I think a small amount to town to the town. Yeah. But we really would like clarification on whether it's all right for us to to hold, you know, for staff to be in the museum and for for um, us to maybe open it for by appointment for individuals to come in and see. Obviously, all subject to the guidelines. And then there's the issue about what the lease for next year sh should be, which is the basic agenda item topic. Okay, let's let's focus on first on you got three items. The first is the $45 credit for what the utilities that you weren't using during the while the building was closed. No, I think it's more for the inability to access the space that we were paying for. Okay, and for how many months were you looking for that? 3. 3 months? 3 and as long as it continues forward. Okay, okay. For, for each for each months. month that the situation prevails. Yeah. Okay, so we're looking three this month. Okay, four months say as a minimum to. Four. Well, depending on what you say about whether we can go in or not. Well. Can I ask you a question? Okay. Um, have, have you all consulted already with the um, with the health uh, uh, board of health about? Um, like appropriate uh, limits on number of people in the room and spacing, that sort of thing. Like, you know, like our local farm stands do it. They get signed off from the Board of Health for whatever their procedures are going to be. Have you been in touch with them 
yet about the space? It hasn't been an issue yet. We haven't been able to use the space. I, I understand, but did, did you go to them with a, what if we can use the space? What would, uh, what would the restrictions be? So it sounds like not yet. Not. Yeah. I think it might, I think it makes all the sense in the world to develop a, a protocol for if the space were to be used, what would be the steps to make sure that people are, are, are staying safe? Um, you know, what's the sanitizing procedure? What's the mask procedure? What's the, how often are you going to sanitize restrooms? Any question that you might think about or somebody else might think about, I think should be addressed in the protocols and, and, and write it down. And I'm not saying that's not a, not a lot of work because it is, but what a lot of places are doing, public organizations are, what's my protocol um, to make sure that people are safe, write it down so that it's sort of memorialized for people to follow. If, if I have protocols, I, I'd be all for this. Yeah. We have controls over our space, but the restrooms are your space. Yeah, but whatever the protocols would be, then we, I mean, we they That's have to include the restrooms. Because we're not going to lock the restrooms and not let you in there. I don't think that would be a good idea. Well, yeah. but you have no being in there. There's now. an issue about custodial services. We have, to be, mm -hmm. we have to be clear what we can do. Right. We have to be so clear I, I, what our responsibilities are and what the towns are. Mm -hmm. exactly. And to some extent, you know, we have we have control over our space and our lock, you know, locked area. But we don't have the ability to set I, rules I, for the, the restrooms or the kitchen or anything. I else. understand, but we, we would we would need to set some rules. Well that's so that's be, one reason that's, we're here. Right, and, but we can't do this without the Board of Health, I don't think. Well, I understand, so, but we have to I, start talking. I would like to move forward on this um, because we can go around and around and around it and talk about it here, but it's not gonna do anything until we kind of have some input from Board of Health. So do you think before our next meeting, we could come up with at least a draft of a plan for the, the, our renters, the Historical Society, to be able to get back in and use their space. I, and, I, and I think that would have to be worked out between the Board of Health and the Stroke Society and probably Brian and, and or Amy um, helping out, sort out the, the things that are on your side of the, the door and the town side of the door. But we're not gonna sort that out at this meeting. I'm not gonna come up with a toilet policy. Um, you don't want my toilet policy anyway, right? <laughs> Uh, but let's let the people who know what they're doing uh, suggest a set of uh, procedures um, to, to use. And let's see if we can't get this sorted out in a way that get, helps you get fit your space, but protects the people who are using it and, uh, and the town and the historical society. That's so, so we're, we're really talking of, of the historic society. Uh, I forget what you call your 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 people. Museum. Uh, museum uh, people being in the building and doing their work, whatever they do. And the other part is is the public allowing the public in. How yeah. are you going to do that or control it or or not? Uh, we, would, we would keep the door locked. We would not open it to the public. Well, I, I think we would want the capability to allow the public in by appointment. Okay where we would know the number of people if somebody wanted you know if there's one it's 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 an option we should have okay well, that's something for you to think about when you're talking with the board of health how well obviously right protocols make sure if that's pick covered pick those parts. if they pick, pick we would not we would not open for general hours of opening but we would, at, at least at this point, we would not. But we would like the capability to think about allowing people by appointment to come in, either to do research or to give a donation, to contribute an article or something. Yeah, again, I, I, I would just want to see the protocols in terms of, you know, if they touch an artifact, what, what's that policy? What's every every piece of of step by step, if they're what what they're going to do, what is our protocol to keep 
keep not only them, but you guys healthy. Yeah. And it's minutia. I mean, it's, and, and you could, you could borrow some from, from the town offices protocols in, in terms of when, when Brian and, and, and that team. We're, we're happy to do this. Okay. We haven't had any sense that it was an option we could pursue. Well, I think now you have a sense that this is an option you can pursue. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay. okay so and, and, then, and then the original topic was the lease. <laughs> okay, I so think re that, yeah. report back uh, to the, us on the protocol when you get that figured out with the Board of Health. Uh, okay, on the, on the lease, the, the one-year annual lease starts in, what, October 1st, I think, is, is your year. And... That states, that's what, $1,600 a year paid quarterly? A fourth of that paid quarterly, yeah. Now uh, that was determined as a rough guess about the utility costs for the building. As 25% um, a, a of, <laughs> of a total stab total. at an estimate of a utility cost because we occupy roughly 25% of the space um, is the derivation. Now, as long as the building isn't used, my assumption is the costs are lower than that. But Right. But only the portions that are used are going to be using any utilities. So I don't know that changing the number. Well, that's not true. You have to keep the pipes from freezing. Right, right. Like but you I don't mean, have the, to heat the, them up to, to the same amount. You're not using at the same rate. I think the minimum. No, obviously that's that yeah. was my point. Yeah, but it's not like they disappear. No, oh, there's, I, still a minimum, there's still a minimum uh, heating and, and even air yeah. conditioning. I think in a summer. Right. So if the rest of the building is on background and one part of the building is not, then it, I just I guess I'm not seeing a reason to change the numbers necessarily i'm not hearing a compelling reason but i do think what they proposed about when they're not allowed in the building um that the 45 dollars a month reduction that is seems completely reasonable to me i, I would agree with that okay, okay so so what they asked for there and then let's let's see what we can do to get make it so that you know there's not a lot of months where you can't get into your space Thank by you. working with the Board of Health and uh, you know, and I don't know if that'll take two weeks or one month or, or what, but we understand it's it's at least halfway up to us. progress. Yeah. What what if we we resolve this by saying every quarterly payment you're doing a rent, uh, we will determine the, the credit, the forty five dollar credit a month and and look at the utility costs of the building if we need to change that. Let's leave it on a quarterly basis. Does that work, Brian? That sounds complicated. Complicated? You don't want that. Okay. <laughs> well, we can do the, the utility costs at the time we renew next year's lease. I year think that now. makes more sense. You want to wait till then after the whole year? Okay. Yeah, we're, it's, it's, we're all flying blind. Okay, so then the, the, the $45 credit, do you, how do you want to do that on a quarterly basis? Deduct it from the first month's rent. From, from for, each for, month's the, rent. for the last three months and then subsequently. Deduct each quarter as it, as it applies. Deduct the last three months from the first payment. And mm -hmm. then if we're not able to get in in October, then you deduct it from the, from the next quarter's payment. A sort of rebate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Make a motion that we do that for the historic society. No, I'll second. Okay. Uh, roll call vote. Jonathan. Yeah. Joyce. Aye. Fred. Yes. Okay. And then we should also have a vote to renew the lease for. Um, October 1st, 2020 to September 30th, 2021. I move that we renew the lease. Second. Okay, we'll call vote, Jonathan. Yeah. Joyce. Aye. Fred, yes. Okay. Anything else from the Historic Society? 
I think we would like to thank Neil Abraham for all his work in helping us with the building and yes. and just in general, dealing with thermostats and, and like that. And if I had to nominate a volunteer for next year's annual report, he would be very high on the list. Brad, you listening? Okay. Oh, Fred, Fred, Thank there's you. your idea. We'll consider it. Gift. That is a gift. I having had to decide on those, it's really hard. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, I have thanks. a couple other ideas too, we'll, but he's pour a lot of pressure, better. one or the other. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, under old business, uh, discuss and vote to approve COMIRS memorandum of agreement for the public safety radio migration project. Brian? So, yeah, this is what, I believe it was our last meeting, this is what Chief Savine was talking about. Um, this is the MOA between, uh, it would be between the town, uh, FERCOG, and, um, and then FERCOG has a um, MOA between the executive off, I, I don't know what it is, um, EEOT something S. It's the, um, it's the state agency that's, that's um, spearheading the radio, uh, the migration of the Franklin County emergency radios over to the state system. Um, and the way that it's, the way that it's been set up is that um what is the the uh, Franklin County Emergency Communication System Oversight Committee um, will sort of be the 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 overseeing group for the Franklin for the Franklin County towns and so we'll we'll be authorizing that group similar to how we do it now with the radio systems in Franklin County um, to kind of be the go between. <clears throat> Um, for us, for the, the migration of the radio systems. Um, there were no changes to the MOA that, that we had previously looked at in the prior meeting. Uh, as far as I know, Jim is, uh, Chief Savine is still expecting the, the police migration to happen um, sooner rather than later. I think he was hoping by December it would happen. Um, so the, we'll be looking for the board to, to sign the MOA that's in the packet. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it. Yeah, I'm fine with it too. Yeah. So we need to come sign it, Brian? <laughs> yeah, you would, you would want to make a motion to, to approve it and then it would need to be signed. I'll make a motion to approve the signing this MOA. Second. Okay, roll call vote. Jonathan? Yeah. Joyce? Yes. Fred? Yes. Okay. Next, under, under new business, I guess I'd like to, to switch the order here since Keith has been uh, with us for a while here. Uh, talk about the maintenance of sidewalks on Chestnut Plain Road. I think uh, that's something that's Going to be coming up when they're when they're completed. Uh, Keith, give us the status of what what's completed, what has to be done yet. Sure. Um, as far as the the sidewalk project, um, everything is wrapping up. Um, they are probably going to complete the paving on the alternate, which was the extension from. Haydenville Road intersection down to the Congregational Church on the west side of the road. That will be pretty much wrapped up tomorrow, paving-wise. Then they just need to loam and seed it. Um, with the rain we got in the last couple of days and last night, the grass that they seeded has germinated on the on the north section. So um, it'll start to fill in and and look. Um, more attractive, so to speak, because those spots are obviously um, where the old sidewalk was, the, all the grass will start to grow. In, so, um, 
it's okay. things are wrap, um, progressing very well there as far as the the paving of the Chestnut Plain Road um, that's been delayed because of rain. Um, I was supposed to originally have it done today, and now I am pushed up to Friday, and oh, now okay. Friday to Monday. So we are um, close to being getting the paving done. The the paving at the library, finishing the top coat of, on the parking lot at the library, will be done the same day. Um, then we'll need to get the striping in. The one last this potential decision at the um, streetscapes or the sidewalk project is if we're going to, um, uh, how tight we are money-wise, whether we change the um, the paint that we are, you know, thermoplastic versus a regular paint. But um, so anyways, everything is looking good. Um, that will be wrapped up fairly soon in the center of town. Okay, so who will be doing the painting? The contractor? Uh, yeah, it's part of it's part of the contract, um, and so just the continuation about the sidewalks into the winter months, uh, maintenance-wise. Um, way back during the budget process, we were at the point where we were discussing certainly looking at options of um, contracting it out versus the town purchasing equipment on their own. Um, things sort of came to a crashing halt when the budget, everything stopped budget wise and, and, and nothing more was done about that. So here we are back needing to discuss it. Um, the biggest concern that I feel that the town needs to, to determine is from a contract side of things is um, policies as far as liability insurance should whoever is plowing or snow blowing the sidewalk do damage to the lawns or do you know if they're snow blowing and the snow blows and picks up a stone and throws it through a window those kinds of things I, I, um, I told Brian we need to contact or we're come up with a um, exact liability insurance that we're going to require. Um, if it's a contractor that is hiring an employee, um, prevailing wages would need to be paid. Um, that would be my understanding anyway. So all these things need to be figured out and we can probably quickly obtain that information by contacting some other towns to see how they handle it since we've never done it before. Okay, Keith, uh, the existing contract for, for paving uh, the sidewalks, is is there money left if we should decide to buy equipment to do it, maintain it? Is No, that's the, the contract that we have with Mass DOT is going to be virtually all used up just in the building the sidewalks <clears throat> okay so I, I guess the the thing that, that I guess I'm not sure of it and maybe because I don't I don't use the sidewalks and I don't drive through town every day is how much use are they getting and Realize now it could be more because they were hazardous before to walk on, but now maybe more people are going to use it. Uh, yeah, there has definitely been a, a, a big increase, and I think it will even go up even more when they're when they're complete and people feel like they're not going to be in the way by using them right now. You know, with the activity going on with them seating on the shoulders of them and things like that people still feel a little apprehensive to use them, but um, I can tell you over the weekend, there's um, there's already been a report of skateboarders using them. So, um, you know, it's, they are going to be used a lot more than what was there. There's no doubt about it. And again, um, when the road gets complete and the crosswalks are in, I feel that will even uh, make people feel more comfortable using them on top of it. Is, is there a problem with skateboarders using it? I, I don't at the moment see it. I'm just um, telling you that 
it was already been reported to me. I haven't seen it myself, but reported that skateboarders were were going up and down the. Now I don't know if they're doing anything other than just going up and down them. If the issue probably starts to happen is when they start set trying to set things up to jump over things and things like that. But well, you know, I, I don't. I think it's you know we should encourage that kind of stuff. But during construction, we don't want to messing up your work on landscaping. That's my that's my immediate concern that. They're not going to have a thought about landscaping if the if the skateboard, uh, if if the state skateboard and the skateboarder, you know, take a dive into the into some of the landscaping you've done, it's more work for us. So, I sort of wonder whether we should have some sign saying "stay off until further notice" or the end of construction or something. At the moment, I would say we would do that if it's. If I felt it's been a problem, there's been no issues. Okay. Uh, the, the limited use of the, the people walking it. Um, in fact, even bicyclists are using it because lately they don't want to ride on the road that's where it's been milled and it's very rough on their bicycles. So uh, again, it, that that's fine. We it's it's not impacting anything, especially with the contractor now working down to the to the south side of Haydenville Road, it's really not an issue. Okay. Okay. And on the, the south end of it, you know, you say uh, from Haydenville Road south, they, they did the the side towards the uh, church. The other side, I guess nothing's going to be done because you got to coordinate with the memorial people there. Uh, is that, of course, is it is it safe for people to use that portion of it now? Well, uh, the existing sidewalk is still there on the east side. Right. From the town hall south. That is right. still there and that can be used just like it was in the past. Again, it's but it's not it's not ADA compliant. It's all, you know, rough and deteriorated, but it's still there and can be used. And you're correct that they, we can't expand going south from the town hall until the sidewalk, I mean, until the veterans memorial has definitely been completed. The last thing we want to do is put in sidewalk and then a year later say, oh, it's in the way and have to tear it out. So, right. so any, whatever we do or hire somebody to do would have to be both sides of the road from center school down to the church. As far as we, you know, we want to maintain it. Yes. That would be what I would recommend that it gets the whole thing. That's that's brand new, get maintained. I don't think we probably should attempt to maintain the old sidewalk on the Southeast corner, so to speak. Well, you may get people concerned about that. I don't know, but I, I guess it's it's feasible. It could be done. It's just that it will be um, rougher and harder on the equipment because in some places there's there's tree roots that are exposed through the sidewalk. There's you know it's certainly not smooth. Is, is there something you could do now since you got paving equipment there to make certain areas of it smoother so you could maintain it in the winter for that, that section? It would have to pretty much be, you know, taken, uh, you know, it's, I don't think that's feasible, Fred. Okay. Well, just for temporary. So you, if you did say have a snowblower going over, you could do it, but. I, I guess. I could look at it a little closer and if we know exactly what the route the town chooses to maintain them, if they choose to maintain them this winter, um, we can address that. Well, and, and complete streets, was that the location of that going to be where it is today or was that going to be closer to the, to the road? I don't understand the question. That, that portion of the sidewalk you're not doing today. What was the plan under constri complete streets to the location for that? 
I believe it will be moving it in between the two rows of trees. So closer to the road. Again, it's the same scenario that where it's presently located, it is almost on the property line. So to make it wider, it becomes a, an issue with the trees and trying not to destroy the roots of the trees. Okay. So that's only, a, I guess, could call it temporary location for, for now where it's at, but. Okay. Well, it seems we need to get some information on if we're to contract out what it would cost to to uh, remove the snow on it, and 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 also uh, if your your I assume your crew would your department would would uh, maintain it if you had the equipment and what equipment do you, would you recommend purchasing for that? The, you know, the discussion I had with some of the towns locally that presently are maintaining them themselves. Um, the one thing that was pretty um, feasible to use would be like a Bobcat, a skid steer type of a machine that can run up and down the sidewalks. That would be something that we would probably um, propose. For the town to do it, your employees. If the town, if the town was to purchase it. And, and the, the, the scenario is we need to look at the, you know, what that cost is and in, in operating expenses versus having a contract to do it. And, and really, until we know what we're going to need to have what we're going to tell the contractor they have to pay prevailing wages when we know what that is and what we know when we tell somebody you need um, two million dollars of liability or five million dollars of liability then they're they're going to be able to to say well that insurance policy is going to cost me this much money per per year and and start to go from to go there you know go from there Okay, and if you're to buy equipment for that, say a skid steer or something, is that equipment something you could use for other other projects in town? Yeah, yes, it's um, you know that's a, a very versatile piece of equipment that can have lots of attachments that um, we can look at. One of the other things that we have um, on my capital planning in the near future is replacing. Um, our utility tractor that we have, which has, you know, like a sweeper broom or ro rotary brooms on them, um, sickle bar mowers, this, you know, the, the skid steer can, can operate all that kind of stuff also. So again, it's something that, you know, timing wise where we are in this stage of the year, I don't see how we probably can recommend coming up with the money and doing it purchasing the town equipment before winter, but I would probably say we might be best to look at just the um, a rent, you know, contractor for the first year, or maybe we're gonna just say that it's the best option forever. I, again, until we start to put some numbers together. Okay, so I guess that's the next, the next step would be for you to Look further, getting some numbers, costs, and and uh, make a recommendation to the board what you what you feel should be done. Uh, I, I guess we we need to decide. Maybe the board decide is that something the town is going to maintain? Is are we going to maintain them sidewalks year round? Because I guess they haven't been done up till now, right? The only thing you maintain is the well. You don't you don't do the grass mowing either, do you? The only no, we don't mow anything in in the center of town except for the town properties, the library, and the center school, and the town hall. Um, and so you're right that that's we the town's got to decide that. Right. Okay. Uh, I think costs might actually influence our decision. 
but um, I, I guess at the moment, my, I, I mean, we're not asking me to vote right now, but I'm inclined to, uh, for snow, keep those sidewalks open, if at all possible, or to do it in as cost-effective manner as we can. So I think it's really important that um, we, you know, look into and think about whatever equipment purchase Keith, Keith might be ready to suggest. So it's, it's probably worth putting some time into that to <coughs> make sure that we do this in the, the, the best possible way. What are other towns? I mean, aren't there a lot of towns that the, the person who's the, you know, if you're a storefront, you, you shovel the sidewalk in front of your storefront. Um, if you're a house, you shovel the sidewalk in front of your house. It's just being part of being a good neighbor. Um, you get into the bigger communities, the cities, Greenfield, Northampton, that's something that, yes, you probably will have bylaws where storefront owners or the property owners have certain many, uh, number of hours after a storm where they have to have it cleared at their expense. Uh, when you go to smaller communities, Deerfield and Sunderland, they do that. All the sidewalks that are maintained are done by the town themselves. Across the entire mile to the town. Yes, that, everywhere there's sidewalks that they make. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Other thing that was that hasn't happened yet that was a suggestion was that if and when the town did purchase equipment, a good place for it to be stored in the winter time would be in the new building that was going to be built for the water merger, where it wouldn't. The, it would be a perfect location to go there, open the door, drive it out, go up and down the sidewalk and put it right back away till the next storm. But that hasn't happened yet either, so. That or the, or the yellow barn. Yeah, either, either or, but the, you know, the, the right, either, either one. Yeah. The other thing, keep in mind, I know Deerfield has a, a lot of sidewalks in town but uh some of them are used for school kids to get to and from school so there there is a direct need by, i guess to, to maintain them whereas for us we don't we don't have that concern i guess and and again i i think let's let's get some numbers together and and come back and view it again and Decide, you may say that we don't have that kind of money to even consider it, or we take it from there. You know, yeah. And I, again, last thought for, for me is that the reason we did complete streets was to make this more walkable downtown, to, to be a connecting point for, for, for residents and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if, if we're essentially saying between the months of you know, let's hope for a white Christmas, mid-December to mid-March. You're, you're just, it's a, it's a more walkable town for nine months out of the year. And I don't know that that's a good use of our, of, of the money we spent on complete streets, but it's just something to think about. All right. Okay. So we'll uh, ask you to get information and report back to us. Okay. Yeah. Anything else you wanted to discuss? I, I just quickly update you on the, um, some of the other things. Williamsburg Road project um, is moving along pretty well. The bridges, the first bridge um, was supposed to be set today, but the, because originally it sounded like it was going to be raining all day, they they had put it off. I believe it's still that's now being doing, done tomorrow. Um, so. Things are progressing pretty well out there. There hasn't been any issues, really. It's been going very smoothly. Um, as I've already said, the Poplar Hill, that's just about complete. And so we're starting to see our projects, summer projects wrapping up. And there's a lot of little, little odds and ends that I've had to put on hold um, because we've been right out straight trying to stay ahead of all of the other things that we've been doing. So. Um, we're in good shape. Okay, that's good. That's good to hear. Keeping it busy. 
Okay, anything else? Anybody has, wants to ask uh, Keith while we have him here? No. No. Okay. All right, good Thank night. You. Thank no. you, Keith. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, other item under new business is to discuss possible projects for the Community Compact Mass IT Grant. Brian? Yeah, so this is an annual grant that comes out and all it's um, available for all community compact community compact communities. Um, so each year we try to figure out what we could apply for. And I think Joyce was contacted by someone from Senator Comerford's office who was contacted by um, one of the residents on North Street who were trying to figure out how they could get um, workable <clears throat> or serviceable internet. Um, and I think it related to uh, remote learning, I believe, right, Joyce? Um, right. The person who contacted me, the one family contacted me, it was about uh, being able to do remote learning. Um, and then there were two others who contacted Joe Comerford's office. So now we've kind of working together. We have three families clustered on the end of North Street there um, that we're trying to see if we can get um, uh, internet too. I've kind of, I've got the um, the cable map in front of me if that becomes useful to show. But there's a, that's the main, the, the main stretch of town that's not serviced by cable is North Street. There are a couple of other areas that we could also investigate. Um, but I think um, they really, North Street is the place where it's the most lacking right now. And we're talking the end, the, towards the Deerfield line, correct? Correct, correct. It's almost closer to wire them into Deerfield, yeah. but um, yeah. on the map, it's sort of, what, when you put the three houses together, it might really be closer to the, the end of the Waitley line. Is that the location where the most houses in town are that don't have service? Correct. Uh, although it, it's hard to know exactly um, what in town is not serviced unless you go out there and ask. The information I have is from 2016 when um, we did our last cable negotiation. Uh, we basically just talked to the people who live near the end of the strands and found out that our strand map was actually uh, a little conservative. The, the strand actually went out a little bit further than the um, Massachusetts Broadband Institute thought it did. Um, because often when people build a house, Comcast will just come and extend the line a little bit at a time and it won't always get updated on the strand map. Uh, but if I look at the strand map, I, um, I know of a, at least one location where it's been extended that it got the extension in 2016. Um, and like generally speaking, though, the one place I would like to check to see if it might um, uh, have some houses that need service would be the end of Haydenville Road. Um, I know back, it was before 2016, uh, we were contacted by uh, a resident who like built the next house on Haydenville Road. Um, and they didn't have cable right there, but I think they got it extended. I don't know if there's been yet another house <laughs> built on Haydenville Road, for example, but that's, um, that is one place um, on this map that might merit a little more work. There's a little place on, uh, on Conway Road that doesn't seem to have any houses and also doesn't seem to have any service <laughs> uh, on the strand map. Um, so that does not surprise me that that's there. Uh, where is the other place? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, here and there, there's places where we could check. Is there anything further up Dickinson Hill Road? Um, is there anything further up Waitley Glen Road? I don't think uh, there is. So it's mostly, you know, so much of the town is covered. It's really just checking uh, the ends of the strands to see um, what's there. But the place where we absolutely know we've got a cluster of houses that need it is uh, is North Street. Okay. So is this the only project we're looking for, Brian, under this grant? Or? Um, well, yeah, we're, we're in the process of trying to gather ideas. Uh, the grant is due, I believe it's October 15th. Um, yeah. So we could try to pull something together before our, our next meeting of uh, on October 14th. Um, but I mean, this seemed to be a, a high need. And looking back at at that former um, or previous projects funded through this grant, they, they have focused on expanding broadband. So 
and and you can't do two uh, two separate uh, projects for one. You you can't apply twice. <clears throat> oh, for two different projects. Yeah, I believe they asked to submit one project, but I'll I can double check. Yeah, but if the project's title is expanding uh, broadband in the town of Waitley, right, it yeah. could be that you put down North Street, and if we find something on these other roads where I think we should check at least, I think that's one project. It doesn't have to necessarily be one physical location. Right. I understand you have to write a budget for it. That's why I ask, so. Oh, yeah, we have some, some rough estimates from Comcast. One of the people actually got to the point of having Comcast come tell them that it was gonna be $8,000 to just get the cable to the end of their driveway, not to mention the hundred and something a month that you'll have to pay for the broadband. Um, so you can imagine that that went over real well. Um, so we, we do have some rough numbers and uh, we've asked Comcast to reconsider all this with the three families together and so on. And and they're, you know, that's moving in parallel, but we thought if we can, um, uh, ask for a grant for this, we kind of got, we have some rough numbers that might be able to work. Okay. And, and if you're coming from the other side, from Deerfield side, is there properties there that don't have access either? I think it's basically the campground. Oh, okay. Is uh, the only thing I see on the map. Yeah. Um, it's on our property though. I mean, our, in our Right. So yeah, if you, if you take North Street from the cluster of houses, um, maybe I can share this map. Would that be okay to share screen, Brian? Yeah, I think you're close. I added you after you, you know, you suggested oh. that just in okay. case like you kicked off. Just in case okay. you um, I was like, oh, sh better add her. <laughs> there we go. So this is, um, this map was actually from 2012. Um, I'll uh, zoom in a little bit um, at uh, the end of North Street here. Um, it shows buildings. I, th I think these are not necessarily houses up here on Waitley Glen, but we should check. This first house here on Whitley Glen is serviced um, by a strand that goes up North Street. It ends right about here. Um, the houses in question, I believe, are uh, right around here. Yeah. Uh, and you can see that's about halfway from where Deerfield Strand ends <laughs> and where the Whitley Strand ends. So um, it would probably come up North Street. I think that would be the better way to do it. Uh, that means they would get Whitley's cable access channels and not Deerfield's. If it comes from here, then they get Deerfield's. Panels, <laughs> uh, which are not that different. Uh, and then I guess this is the campground. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that they are um, interested in in getting service at this point. Hey, George, um, there are three houses there or just two? I, I'm counting two. I know there are three, three. addresses on North Street. There uh, are. And, uh, and I, I, I know at least one of them is at this kind of bend in the road. Yeah. Um, and I assume that the other is uh, one of these other houses, and the, but there are three, three people who have been in touch. There are three addresses. Okay, I'm, I'm just trying to visualize them. I, mean, I know of two. Right. I know. The yeah. People. Yeah. I me, me too, and I don't know if if you know maybe it is actually further. You know, maybe there's a, a building like this map is from 2012. Could yeah. there is there some new construction here that's not let, shown on this map? Could the MBI not have had complete? information and there's a house there that's not shown with a little gray block, that's also possible. Okay. So that's why with the, when we did this back in 2016, we just, uh, I just called, like I know one of the people there whose child was in my child's class. So I just called and said, how are you guys doing? Uh, you guys don't have broadband, do you want it? In 2016, the, the answer was no, we don't want it. But you know, things, things have changed. Um, so it's really getting to be more of a necessity. Um, same thing, has there been building up here on Dickinson Hill Road? I don't know, but we can ask people. The The people on the ground will be really good resources. And then the other part, um, I don't know if there's been a little more building here on Haydenville Road. Um, uh, so sorry, I think I'm pointing the wrong place. On Haydenville Road, there uh, there might be a little um, a little more building there. I don't know. So that's the thing. those are the things to check out and it's gonna mean somebody making phone calls or uh, you know, and you're know, looking up who's who is down there that I know and I can call and I can ask. Are we allowed to anticipate growth? For the purpose of the, hmm, I don't know. Brian might know for the purpose of this contract, whether or the, uh, 
for the purpose. I mean, you obviously wouldn't the extend the cable line to a house, but if you make sure that the cable runs all the way to where houses could potentially, be, or once were and might be again. Yeah, I don't know if we could pull that off in two weeks. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. And I don't know if Comcast would be willing to do that. Well, I imagine if we pay for it, they would, but. <laughs> yeah. uh, Joyce, the, the other area that's developed uh, since 2016 on your map here is Masterson Road, the North End. Oh, oh okay. That's a good point because there is a little spot on this map anyway. There's so, several um, good so size. That part of Masterson Road is not service, but there's been more. Uh, housing, you say, then we, we should call and find out. Um, because there are times, like, I was really surprised. The the first time we went through this in 2006, um, I was asking people up on Laurel Mountain Road, and they were like, oh yeah, I just called Comcast, they put it in. There was no problem, they didn't charge me extra. So there are, there are some places, I think, where when houses are closed and they feel like that is going to get developed, they'll often just do it. So yeah, I agree. Let's add um, this upper part of um, Masterson Road to the list of places we should check and see that that the strand is uh, is actually pulled up there. Um, over here, for example, um, there's a place where I know this strand map is inaccurate uh, and that the service actually goes out to these folks who are in the circle. So my map is not necessarily 100% correct. So we do need to look at that a little more carefully and just check the Check the edges, and thank you for pointing out Masterson Road as a uh, a place to double check. Okay. Fred, do the assessors have um, like a listing of houses built in the past couple of years? You know. Yeah, there there probably is, or you can go on the uh, building inspector's website and see what. Yep. Permits have been pulled for, for new houses. Uh, and of course, they're going to show up on the, the assessor's map or the, the houses that are there. And I guess you could look in that area to see when they were built. Uh, on the assessor's map, it would, uh, the sheet, uh, assessor's, uh, the card, property card would tell you when it was built. Yeah. Right. If we need, to look in right. for more detail. Yeah, and it, it maybe we do a little work with the assessor's maps to see what's, um, you know, the areas where we need to explore. But I guess the message is, I think in two weeks, it's doable to find out, uh, like basically make the extensions on this strand map for ourselves. Um, it would take much longer than two weeks to get Comcast or Massachusetts Broadband Institute to do it for us. Can I assume Pine Plains Estates has service? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, there's, yeah, there is a, a, con, a clause in our contract with Comcast that if um, you are on a street where there is greater than um, uh, was it, 30, well, most of the state, it's 30 houses per mile, but we got it cut down to 15 houses per mile. If your street has that much housing density, then they have to put it in without charging you the like the extra getting it to the end of your driveway sort of thing. Um, and Pine Plate Estate is definitely uh, a place where they have that enough density. So it's just, it's in there and they're making money off of Pine Plains Estate already. Um, Joyce, what about if, if you go down LaSalle Drive? Oh yeah, yeah, that area is interesting. Because that came up. Your Claverack Road meets yes. the South Drive, and then you continue going south. There are two no longer being used houses, and I'm wondering whether our our why our lines go all the way to the end of that road. Yes, they do. They I do. I mean, that's what that's what I'm showing here. Okay, I couldn't. They already go there, uh, and I, this came up a few years back when the folks who were living over here were not getting service. Yeah, uh, that was in 2006. And we got that in our 2006 negotiation that they said, well, look, there's, there's this many houses. They're all clustered together. If you had them spread out, that would be, that fits within the 15 houses per mile. Um, and they decided to, to bring it from uh, uh, Long Plain Road, sorry, from Chestnut Plain Road instead of bringing it from LaSalle Drive. 
but it, again, it was like the distance is really almost the same. <laughs> so, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. It goes all the way to the field. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. So, right. have we beat this enough? I'm for this. I like this idea. Yeah, I would move that we we move that we move on this. My okay. move, they, they could say no, and we don't get the money, but you know, nothing ventured. Right. I'll go ahead and second. stop sharing then. I'll second. Okay. Roll call vote. Jonathan. Yeah. Brad. Uh, uh, Joyce. Hi. Brad. Yes. Okay, uh, moving on, town administrator updates. Did we talk about most of these already? Oh, we talked about a lot of them, uh, just ones I want to touch on. We seem to be getting um, more resignations than we've gotten in the past, um, or people not wanting appointments. Um, so we'll talk about vacancies for a second. So Richard Tilburg did, um, has declined appointment to continue as the uh, FRTA rep. So we'll need to find somebody to, who wants to do that. Uh, he had suggested Catherine Wolkowitz, but I, I haven't talked to Catherine about it yet, but I think she's pretty busy. And uh, his suggestion was based on her being the chairperson of the housing committee. So mm -hmm. that's something maybe we, we can put out to see if anybody's interested. Well, it's not really related to housing, but. Well, in terms of access to public transportation, it sure is. Well, that way, I guess. Yeah. Oh no, it's. I mean, why do you put housing where there's no transportation? I mean, it's it's pretty big. I might suggest that we find a sen a senior who might be interested in serving on that because, you know, public transportation is is pretty important as you get as you get older and 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 where all of us are heading more frail. Uh, I'm not sure it's appropriate to have anyone on FRTA that is desperate to have FRTA and PBTA merged, so I will decline. <laughs> and I guess I was on it before Richard did, and uh, I did it too. Yeah. I guess I would I would hold off to see who else we we if we get any other interest, and I guess I'd volunteer if we have no other interest. I think I think a senior if you could find a senior who's interested in it, because it's a huge senior issue. Okay. Yeah. Um. So that's my that's my correction from before. Um. So in terms of of tents at the elementary school, um, they have been ordered, but they have not been received yet. There was a delay in ordering them because they needed to find uh, tents that were fire resistant and were certified as such. So those were ordered last week. I don't think they've come in yet. Um, so the meta grant that I was hoping we would get, that's the municipal energy technical assistance grant, um, for help filling in the details for the elementary school, the elementary school work. Um, we were not awarded that, um, there was not an explanation as to why. Um, so I guess that's a discussion for a future meeting as to how we want to try to move that forward. Um, we submitted an application for the shared streets and spaces grant. That was, we were able to apply for what's the, what was the second priority of, on our complete streets plan. That was the extension of the sidewalk at the elementary school. And we also added, um, with that we added the school zone radar speed signs. And um, I think we also included two other pole mounted uh, radar speed signs uh, because we had room to ask um, within the minimum, uh, the maximum amount of the grant. Um, I believe you have, speaking of resignations, um, Sue Monahan has submitted a letter of resignation from Tritown Beach. That's effective. Uh, the letter says it's effective uh, at the end of December. So it'd be the first of the year. And there's also one, uh, there's, there also has been one vacancy and is one vacancy. So that would, this makes two um, as of December. So I have a couple of ideas on that. So I want to, before we think too hard about, I have some ideas that I want to talk about when, when Sue's term is over. Um, so it came up in, in 
when we were advertising and trying to get notice out about um, the school committee position. And it's always been in the back of my mind about uh, an official uh, social media page for the town. Um, we have Facebook accounts for the police department, fire department. I believe the Whitley Recreation has one. Um, but we don't really have a social media presence for the town. And people aren't getting out a lot. I don't know how many people would see something that's posted here normally, but we don't have people coming through uh, that would see stuff on a bulletin board. And I just wanted to get the board's feeling on, on whether it's time that we do that. One of my big concerns is, is comments um, on, any, on any social media page. I, I would be inclined to not allow comments. Um, because that can, that can, those can turn pretty quickly. Comments that are made are considered public records, and there's a process you have to go through to catalog them and then delete them. Um, so it can it can become very time consuming very quickly. Um, and we would want um, we would want obviously we want a, a social media policy as to how we're going to maintain and administer that account. Um, so I was just wondering if you had thoughts about that. What would you put on there that we don't have, I guess, what on our on our website now? Is that what, the, what it would be? Yeah, one of the benefits, one of the benefits of having the, the, the social media page is that if people follow or depending on the platform you're on, if you follow or like the page, things that we would post would automatically show up in people's news feed. Um, so when people go onto Facebook or, or whatever they do, then it would automatically show up when they're scrolling through um, their posts or news items. Mm -hmm. I, I my main concern is that we do this and if, if we decide we want to do this, it, if it seems like the benefits outweigh the cost, um, is that we do this in a way that it doesn't uh, take a lot of somebody's time to update. And I know there's often I don't know on our website, but there's often ways when you're posting something on the website, it's just one more box click and you can, uh, and it goes to your Facebook and things like that. Yeah, um, that's, that's I, cool. I agree having a, um, a policy and practices that mean maintaining it is not um, a high, well, a high maintenance <laughs> sort of thing, right? Because I, it's, it's not like we have people sitting around the town offices or working from home uh, twiddling their thumbs, wondering what we can do. I don't have anything to do, right? We That's just not the case. So um, I, if there's some advantages that we might reach more people that way, then that's probably um, worth considering it. And um, uh, But setting it up, and, and I'm, I no longer use Facebook, so I don't really know how to set one up so that it won't be very much maintenance. Yeah. But I think that you're, you're considering the exact right things there. So I, I would... I would only also suggest that, you know, and it, and it, and it echoes Joyce's concern about finding, finding a system that isn't gonna take a lot of time. The danger is that social media pages that lack attention um, are, are useless. So if you're gonna post something once every three weeks, don't bother, because no one's gonna read it. It's not gonna get high up on the news feed. It, it just, it, it's just not gonna get, Get noticed you've got to keep it fresh otherwise don't do it yeah okay so would, would this be uh like articles that are in the scoop would be on there no no i think it'd be announced as like town official town stuff official town stuff okay. right so for instance we would so what we would post on the website for uh vacancy in the school committee we would also click a box and it would it would it would automatically post to the facebook page that people have liked, so automatically that post, assuming it's high enough in the newsfeed, would go to that person's mobile device when they're go open up Facebook and are looking through and looking through pages right. um, or posts. I mean, um, there's other things that we could put links to. Hazard mitigation plan is available for review. Um, just, just a lot of things that indefinitely things that that robocalls would that we would do for robocalls. We would want on there. 
Um, it's just another means of, of, of reaching out to people who really, I think reaching out to younger people who, who don't necessarily go to the website, but are on their mobile devices often. Um, I don't, I don't know that we're reaching mm -hmm. younger folks in town with, with our current, uh, with our current outreach. No, that's true. And we, and we always want to try to interest young people to, to, you know, about what's going on in town government, et cetera. But if we use outdated methodologies um, to, to make town government attractive, we're never going to get more volunteers. We're never going to, so mm -hmm. it, it serves a purpose on a number of different levels. Yeah. So, so maybe as a next step, I'll, I'll look at, and I, I pulled a couple of them. They um, towns have some social media policies that are pretty straightforward. Um, but again, my biggest concern is, and I, and I think we, we alleviate that concern by not allowing comments, is that I think we've all seen on social media, people don't have the, the greatest manners. So mm -hmm. um, I think we want to avoid that. And that's a concern that honestly, that's a concern that I have with, with some of the existing Facebook pages that we have in town, because I believe comments are allowed. And mm -hmm. when it hits the page, when someone posts, it's considered a public record. Um, and we mm -hmm. can't go out deleting public records. Right. Um, so there's there's steps that need to be taken and this policy could apply to, it really should apply to all of those pages. Oh, okay. Then we probably wanna give the people running those Facebook pages a heads up. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly do that. So who would maintain this in your office, Ryan? Um, oh, Amy's here, so she could do it. Yeah. Um, and I think you're plugged into the young folks too. Yeah, that's She's right. More than any of us. She's the youngest. The youngest person in the office has to do it. So apparently, there you go. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, I, a lot of it will be generated. I think from from like Joyce talked about from the website. Yeah, and that, you know the the other thing is, you, I've often thought that, and I get it's a management issue that, you know, we should be offering internships to people who want to go into uh, municipal government as a career, um, and social media would be a, a great um, task, ongoing task for an intern, um, that kind of thing. So, you know, I, I think we should do this, but yeah. And, you know, I mean, we could use it for, you know, uh, rec signups for soccer are, are coming up and right. go here and basketball and Tritown Beach is opening maybe someday. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's a pancake breakfast at the school. Or I just think there's a lot of ways to to use it that we're not necessarily doing right now. So, yeah. And okay. I, I think it's probably worth a shot. And if it if it, if it doesn't work out, we can always... Let's pull it down. You can always yeah. pull it out if we need to. Friends of Whitley Town Hall has a has a Facebook page, and it's it, it, if 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 sub organizations across town like Rec or Whitley, you know, and I created both of those. It it, it it's gonna get traffic. It's gonna get a lot of it. No? Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't think anybody's objecting to to at least taking the next step and coming up with a policy, and right. Uh, we'll look forward to that at another meeting. Okay, yep. sounds sounds good, Brian. Okay, what else do you have on uh, updates? Um, just an update. Um, so I talked about a second grant that that was applied for for uh, the radar feedback science, radar speed feedback science. That's the FY twenty one burn grant um, that Jim had submitted. That's through the Department of Justice. Um, and then so the municipal ADA improvement grant is due. Um, it's due October 9th. Um, I reached out to the library trustees with the idea that we would resubmit um, for the library lift project and see what happens. So I was wondering if, if the board was all right with that. Yeah. I think that's our biggest ADA issue right now, isn't it? Yeah. Sure, go ahead. And let's learn from where we, if, they, if we gave feedback, let's make sure we respond to that feedback. Yeah. Yeah, we will. Uh, okay. Um, that's about it. We, we heard about, well, we wanted the news, everybody wanted the news today about, um, one of our people who are pursuing a, a marijuana 
retail establishment in town. Um, and there's some issues in, in Connecticut. Um, I look through the host community agreement. We don't have much in the host community agreement that talks about those types of things. Obviously, um, everybody has their day in court. And um, I think it would be premature for us to, to try to take any action. Um, but the, the host community agreement does talk about if, if someone is, is unable to obtain a license from the, the CCC or has a license revoked by the CCC, um, then the host community agreement would, would, would not continue with the town. So yeah. um, I think at this point, it's just a wait and see. It's just a wait and see approach. There's no way that they would open in the interim before that's cleared in Connecticut, is there? I would. As well, it's in the hands of the CCC, right? What's that? If the CCC lets them open, then if the CCC if, were to let them open, then, then we would have no recourse. The person would, yeah. would take, a, take a risk whether they wanted to proceed or not. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um, so that's, 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 that topic. Um, I have a, I was contacted by the folks who, um, were looking to do the, uh, marijuana cultivation operation on river road. Um, I believe the ZBA issued them a special permit, right, Fred, right, yes. marijuana cultivation. And they were contacting me about, um, trying to explore areas for, uh, manufacturing and processing that aren't currently allowed uh, as part of cultivation. So our bylaws are allowed cultivation in the in the in the um, in the agricultural residential districts, but they don't allow manufacturing or process. So mm -hmm. they're trying to figure out possible locations um, and wanted to talk about possible rezoning. So I'm just gonna I have a call set up with them on on Friday to see what what they want to mm -hmm. talk about, but. I know. Um, I know the other the other person who was going to set up a retail store at One Call Does It All. The same person we were just talking about also had wanted to discuss uh, areas for manufacturing and processing. So it, it seems to be a recurring issue that's coming up: is people who want to grow, but then they can't really find a location no, close by that they can manufacture and process their their crop at. So it's a, it's a vertical challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Are there still um, plots in the industrial park available? Um, I believe the only other one is owned by uh, Cavestro. Well, Cavestro and Fairview Farms, right? Um, yeah. Are yeah. the two that have oh, okay. location. Cavestro has plans to, to expand. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. okay. But I think that's about it. Keith covered all the other ones. I'm glad he was here because he could do a better job than me. Yeah. But he's he's honestly he has been straight out and everything seems to be going really well. So he deserves all the oh, credit yeah. in the world. Those okay. are for those are for, for Keith. There we go. He's he's got his new employee working already. Yep. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, we'll call vote down then. Yeah. Joyce? Yep. Fred, yes. Okay.